everyone, this is Chris with the Ancient Scholar, and pick up, uh, this is video three, picking up where I left off. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about um, the contraindications to mechanical ventilation. There, are, there really are no absolute contraindications. A lot of gray area here, as, you, as you'll soon find out in the clinical environment. Um, the closest absolute contraindication I can think of is somebody that has an untreated tension pneumothorax. Um, clearly, positive pressure ventilation is going to make this patient acutely deteriorate. Um, I would highly suggest that you treat that pneumothorax first. Put a uh, dart them, put a chest tube in, and then uh, reassess, reevaluate, and reconsider um, mechanical ventilation after you've taken care of that emergency. Uh, some of the relative contraindications would be uh, like patients informed consent. Um, and maybe this is a patient that, that has some sort of DNR or DNI do not intubate order and they don't want aggressive interventions and um, they haven't consented for that. Now obviously a lot of things fall under implied consent where the patient presents, you know, we don't really know their history, we don't know what their wishes are and we have to make that decision for them um, at that time, you know, in a time of crisis and um, you know, sometimes, you know, you only find out later that they didn't want to be intubated. But, but again, you know, a lot of gray area, and we, we always have to, to kind of err on the side of caution in a lot of cases. Uh, medical futility would be another relative contraindication. Maybe, see, maybe um, somebody is in cardiac arrest, and they, they've, they've, they have a massive head trauma, um, and uh, you've been working them for 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, this probably is not a good candidate for being placed on mechanical ventilation. Um, you no, know, those are really the, the relative contraindications I can think of. Um, some other, you know, maybe somebody with, with some sort of terminal illness like cancer, um, where you, you may end up causing undue suffering and, and perhaps, you know, the family and the patient agree that they, they don't want this, that, you know, they... They don't want to be intubated, even if it would prolong life, that perhaps it would prolong the patient's suffering, and, and they decide that it isn't their best wishes not to be intubated. That would be another situation. So uh, a lot of situations there, a lot of things you can talk about, and you're going to experience some of these in the clinical environment. Okay, so what are the goals of mechanical ventilation? Well, the primary goal, the number one goal, should always be liberation. Now, your instructors will probably use a word called weaning. Um, I personally don't like uh, the term weaning, and um, uh, kind of one of my mentors, even though he may not even know it, is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Jeffrey Guy, um, who is a, um, a surgical intensivist at, um, at, at Vandy uh, in their, uh, their surgical uh, burn unit. And... Um, he kind of coined this term a few years ago when I listened to his podcast series. This is a good podcast series. It's called ICU Rounds. Uh, you can download it for free on iTunes. I definitely uh, would recommend anybody uh, looking at that series that, that's interested in critical care. But um, he kind of coined this term um, liberation. And I really like that term a lot. That we're, our aim is to liberate our patient from that ventilator versus to wean them. Uh, be that as it may, you'll probably hear weaning quite a bit more than you'll hear liberation. Um... It is basically an analogous concept. It is get the patient off the ventilator. Um, you know, aside from all the other complications I talked about earlier, you know, things like ventilator-associated pneumonia, um, and all kinds of other problems can occur. And really, the, the sooner we can get our patient off a ventilator and breathing on their own, more physiologically, the better off our patients are going to be. Um, the less days that they're going to spend in the hospital and the ICU, and obviously that, that, that equates to, to less money, but it also equates to better outcomes because if we can get our patients out of the hospital sooner, they don't get infections, they don't fall, and they don't ultimately um, have increased morbidity and mortality. So really the goal should be to get them off the ventilator. Um, some of the, the more immediate goals would obviously effective ventilation, effective oxygenation, decreasing the work of breathing, and then attempting to limit, uh, limit the consequences of positive pressure ventilation, something we'll talk about in, in later videos. Okay, so initiating mechanical ventilation. We're finally getting there. When we talk about initiation of mechanical ventilation, I like to break it down to six steps. 
six distinct steps. And what we're talking about here is just the initiation, just making the decision that they need it and the initial setup, nothing else. All the other stuff we'll talk about later, but right now this is just the initial ventilator setup. So step one, you've got to get your equipment set up and you've got to perform what's known as an SST on the ventilator. That is a, a short um, shelf or short self test. And uh, most of the modern uh, microprocessor ventilators have a basically a prescription that you, that you need to follow. Each ventilator is, is, is different, but you'll need to do that test. And generally the ventilator will, will check itself, make sure it's working, and then it'll, it'll um, do a, comp a compensation test for uh, tubing compliance. Um, which we'll, is so something we'll talk about here in a little bit. Then, after that, you need to decide on the type of ventilation. And the type of ventilation is going to be based on cycling. And basically what cycle means is to change from inspiration to exhalation. And there are two types, uh, major types of cycling, and that is volume controlled and pressure controlled. We'll talk about them. Generally, your initial setup in an adult patient is initially going to be on volume control ventilation. Okay, so then we go to what's known as the mode of ventilation. Mode of ventilation, um, there's a lot of talk about modes. In the initial setup, the mode is not as relevant. Um, as long as it's a mode, um, as long as it's a mode that that um, basically can control the rate and volume or pressure. Um, so putting somebody in a spontaneous mode where they're doing all the work of breathing on their own is, is not a good idea for the initial setup on a ventilator in most cases. Um, you want to put them in some sort of what we call a support mode. Okay. Um, then we decide on the settings, and these are things like how much volume to give, how much pressure to give them, what uh, FiO2 do I want to give them, how much PEEP do I want to give them, what respiratory rate, and um, you know what ID ratio, and so on and so forth. Those are the settings. Then, step five, we need to set our alarms. What is our low pressure alarm, our high pressure alarm, our low volume alarm, our high volume alarm, and so on and so forth. And apnea parameters as well fall into that. And then step six, we attach, we monitor our patient, and we see how our patient's doing. So in the next um, several videos, I'll go over these, these individual steps in a little more detail. Thanks for hanging in there, guys. Take care.